Welfare officials have admitted fabricating quotes from fictional claimants in a leaflet about benefits. The documents were issued by the Department for Work and Pensions. And Lewis Vaughan Jones is at Westminster for us now. Lewis, this is a, a bit embarrassing, isn't it, for DWP? Yes, I think it is. The government introduced a new sanctions regime and to try and explain how it would work, they produced a leaflet. So we can take a look at the leaflet now. There were two case studies, two examples, Zach's story and Sarah's story on it. And in it we hear Sarah describing the fact that she didn't complete her CV, so her benefits were docked. But then she did complete it and now her benefits are back up and she's really pleased with how her CV looks. The problem is she doesn't exist and nor does Zach. The Labour Party said the only way the government could find people to support their sanctions regime was to invent them. In response, the DWP have said that the case studies were used for illustrative purposes to help people understand how the benefit system works and they have now been removed to avoid any confusion. Lewis Vaughan Jones in Westminster, thank you. Now, don't try this excuse if you'll get caught claiming benefits when you shouldn't. Red-faced officials at the Department for Work and Pensions have admitted that the case studies on a leaflet about sanctions were all made up. The quotes and photographs of people describing how sanctions had helped them see the error of their ways were, quote, for illustrative purposes only, insisted the DWP, but the leaflets have been withdrawn rather hastily. Here's Jane Dodge. It's a Department of Work and Pensions production. Enter stage left, Sarah. She appeared on the DWP website telling her story of claiming sickness benefits. Enter stage right, Zach. He also made an appearance in the same production. Only problem is that Sarah and Zach don't actually exist. They're fictional characters made up by the department. On this occasion, centre stage is probably the last place the DWP would like to be. It says in a statement that the case studies were to help people understand the benefit system and they were based on conversations with claimants. But it has now subsequently removed those case studies from its website. It's hard to imagine where the DWP got Sarah's story from. In the fictional biog, she has her benefits stopped for two weeks because she's failed to write a CV and missed a meeting. Yet she concludes she's pleased with how her CV looks now. It's the Work and Pensions Minister Ian Duncan Smith who's leading the charge with tougher sanctions for those claiming benefits. Half a million people have been sanctioned in the last year. Their benefits stopped for anything from a few weeks to a few years for failing to comply with government requirements for job seekers. The former chief economist at the DWP under Labour says the fake case studies fit into a pattern. Often sanctions are justified. They are a necessary part of any benefit system. But there is considerable evidence that they have been overused. And I think it's very unfortunate that the DWP has been frankly misleading the public when it publishes the statistics on sanctions and again it's very unfortunate that this sort of um, made up quotes or made up case studies should be used to give an incorrect impression of what the real impact is. But even those who support the government's tougher stance on benefits are left scratching their heads. I don't think the government does need to make up case studies. I think the government can point to the success of the policy thus far in getting people off the welfare rolls and into work uh, and not to spend time, and dare I say it, taxpayers' money on this kind of spin. We'd be none the wiser about Sarah and Zach if it wasn't for a freedom of information request from the Welfare Weekly website. The DWP is no doubt hoping this particular production won't be showing again. The Department for Work and Pensions has admitted issuing a leaflet containing made-up quotes from fictional claimants. Our political correspondent Alan Sodi can tell us more. What was the leaflet for, Alan? Well, it was designed to make sure that some claimants follow the rules where they are required to do certain things to boost their chances of getting some paid work. So, for example, this leaflet included someone purported to be called Sarah, accompanied by a picture of a woman, uh, which effectively said that she had been delighted that, in effect, her benefits had been docked because she hadn't completed a CV and she'd missed an appointment with her work coach, but 
but she said in this apparent testimonial that her CV was much better now and so were her chances of getting a job. The other case study was someone called Zach, again accompanied by a photo of a man who said that he had followed the rules and was glad that he had because he hadn't had his benefits docked. So what is it that the Department for Work and Pensions has admitted making up? Both the name and the photographs. The photos, they say, were from uh, stock shots and the names, just these people don't exist. Similarly, nor do the stories. It's not as if these had been real people turned into actual stories. The quotes are made up as well. But the Department for Work and Pensions is defending itself, saying that they were only ever intended, and I quote, for illustrative purposes um, and that they have now though been removed to remove any confusion. Initially it seemed as though they were going to leave them up but with just a silhouette instead of the photographs but they have now been taken down. However the Department for Work and Pensions also says that they were based on actual conversations that their staff had had with a number of claimants. Well all of this does give rather a, 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 some levity for a rare moment to the Labour Party who've been having a bit of fun in their response to this coming up with a statement saying you couldn't make it up, except it seems they say Ian Duncan Smith, the Work and Pensions Secretary, has a rather more serious response from the disability charity MenCap, which is accusing the department of unacceptable behaviour. Alan Sodi at Westminster. Now, figures quoted by the Department of Work and Pensions have, yet again, been disputed by the statistical watchdog. They are the latest misleading stats on benefits quoted by the government to support their welfare reforms. This time, Parkinson's campaigners have taken issue with the department, saying that half of the decisions for disability living allowance were made on the basis of a claim form alone without supporting medical evidence. The real figure is closer to 10%. And the body overseeing national statistics in the UK agrees. Jackie Long reports. A vision for radical reform built on hard facts. That's the claim. But the figures used by Ian Duncan Smith and his government don't always seem to add up. He claimed, already we've seen 8,000 people who would have been affected by the benefit cap move into jobs. The UK Statistics Authority said, Unsupported by official statistics. Using DWP figures, the Tory chairman, Grant Shapps, claimed nearly a million people on incapacity benefit had dropped their claim rather than face tough new tests. The UKSA said, The figures appear to conflate two sets of statistics. The actual number of people who'd taken themselves off benefit was closer to 20,000. Such was the concern the Work and Pensions Secretary was asked to explain to MPs his claim that the benefit cap was seeing thousands go back to work. And I believe to be the case that those people are going back into work uh, hugely to do with the fact that we're introducing the cap. That's my belief, but they said that that should remain as a flat statistic. And now this. The government's claim that more than 50% of decisions for disability living allowance were made simply on the basis of a claim form without any additional medical evidence. Well, the Statistics Authority said that was ambiguous and had not been rechecked by the department. A more accurate figure was just 10%. Donna O'Brien from Parkinson's UK submitted this latest complaint to the Statistics Authority. And the real figures suggested that people were having to do a bit more than simply sign a form as it was often said by the government. Absolutely, I mean they were getting evidence from um, their neurologists, their Parkinson's nurses, their GPs, occupational therapists, some were going for an assessment as well so it's wrong to portray people as if, if, as if they just had to fill in a claim form and then the benefit would magically appear. Because in your view that wasn't true? It wasn't true, no, absolutely. This is not just a recent blip, as far back as 2011, the Work and Pension Select Committee warned the DWP and the wider government that it needed to take more care when releasing and commenting on benefit statistics to make sure that media stories about people on benefits were accurate. Three years on, and the question now being asked is are these problems with statistics down to incompetence or a willful attempt to mislead? 
The Department for Work and Pension says the Statistics Authority has only written to the DWP on a small number of occasions and they've taken on board their suggestions. But those scrutinising the department says much more needs to be done to make sure the way the figures are presented doesn't lead to an unfair portrayal of those on benefits. We have been critical of the way that the, the DWP has published statistics and hasn't made it clear the different um, types of benefit that they're talking about or indeed they haven't contextualised the, the, the statistics properly so that it's allowed others, um, perhaps for whatever political reason, to make a political point with statistics which is actually a false point and it has led to a lot of unrest and unease, particularly amongst disabled people. Ian Duncan Smith says the figures show his reforms are necessary and they're working. He has yet to convince everyone that that's what the numbers are saying. Well, we asked Ian Duncan Smith or any other minister from the Department for Work and Pensions uh, to come on the programme tonight, but no one was available. Now, welfare has always been an emotive subject. False claims, unfair assessments, controversial reforms, all adding to the toxic mix of the arguments swirling around. But tonight, we report on some of its casualties, people for whom it may have been too much to bear. The Department of Work and Pensions does not keep a record of how many people take their own lives because of welfare rulings, but it does admit to carrying out 40 reviews since 2012 in connection with suicides. Kieran Jenkins has the story of two claimants. This is Julia Kelly, long before the two car accidents that changed her life. But you're so naughty. Julia's future would be chronic pain and reliance on benefits. She took her own life in November last year. We know it wasn't easy for Julia because she said so. She headed her own charity and she spoke of her fight to get the benefits she believed she deserved. Even though I had overwhelming medical evidence, you know, you having to go through tribunals, you know, with Guardian, Stephen, ESA, and it, that, that just, just that stress on top of everything else that you're going through, um, it, it, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's almost enough to make you crack. This one is of Julia. Um a month before she died. In her final weeks, Julia was in pain. Her father suspects she was depressed. She'd also received letters from the Department for Work and Pensions asking her to repay benefits she'd claimed. Dear Miss Kelly, the heading we are contacting you. I'm conducting an investigation into alleged criminal offences in relation to a claim to benefit. This is a very serious matter which I need to discuss with you urgently. How do you think she would have felt then reading this? She was absolutely petrified. Last week, a coroner recorded a verdict of suicide. The coroner said upset caused by the potential withdrawal of her benefits had been the trigger for Julia to end her life. I feel um, obviously um, bitter that we don't have Julia anymore and perhaps the reason that she finally did it um, perhaps could have been avoided. We could have never cured the pain, but I think that the way the letters were sent, the way the whole matter was handled by the authorities could have been treated in a different, in a different way. I believe as a society, we must have a responsibility to vulnerable people. A spokesman at the DWP said their thoughts were with Julia's family, but they said employment support allowance, which Julia claimed, was means tested, and if someone has sufficient savings, they may no longer be entitled to it. Want dinner? Hey, we want. There can, though, be many reasons for a suicide, and families can never know for sure what they were. You enjoying that, are you? Dave West, however, has survived to tell his story. A letter would come that day, because there seemed to be letters come nearly every day, and every time a letter come, it got worse. What the letters were saying back in April 2013 was that Dave's housing benefit was being reduced, his incapacity benefit cut. Despite diabetes and depression, Dave had been found fit to work. I was left with um, roughly a pound a day to live on after I paid my bills and that was a pound for food, clothes, travel, and it cost three pounds something to get to the doctors. So I just, I couldn't cope, I couldn't, um, I knew that I couldn't live like that. 
Dave tried twice that month to take his own life. I knew I wasn't fit for work. Um, my finances were being squeezed. I was losing my home where I brought up uh, six children. It was like shifting sands. Everything just moved. It was like having a rug pulled out from under your feet. The Department for Work and Pensions confirmed Dave's appeal was eventually successful. He's been receiving employment support allowance ever since. What we don't know is just how many benefits claimants have taken their own lives, because the DWP isn't counting. What they have done, though, is to review some of these cases. 49 reviews, in fact, since 2012. 40 of them have been suicides. And in 30 of these reviews, there have been calls for improvements within the DWP. What they won't do, though, is make any of those details public. Campaigners aren't happy, but the DWP says publishing its recommendations would be inappropriate because they contain extremely personal information. The Department for Work and Pensions say these details, they're private. The Department of Work and Pensions should be open and transparent about the findings from the benefit-related inquiries they've carried out in the last three years. It is in the public interest that the information be released. In the absence of these reviews, though, mental health charities have their own thoughts about how the government should communicate with vulnerable people. If in the end somebody receives a letter out of the blue and it causes them huge anxiety and they lose their benefits and they become more unwell or in tragic cases take their own lives, then there is no economic sense in that at all. So I think a much more sensible understanding tone which begins with recognising that they have an illness but they want to go back to work is, is the key. Oh, cheers. Who knows whether heeding this advice would save any lives. What the family of Julia Kelly say, though, is that it's surely worth a try.